Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit in June 2021 um, about SEMGREP. This is, I just checked, is actually our 10th session around SEMGREP, which is a really exciting uh, you know, technology to do, you know, to find issues on the source codes. And uh, we have Clint who's going to walk us through you know, one of the key challenges, which is how you scale, right? How you scale, you know, in a way, SEMGREP in your security program, right? So over to you, Clint. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for having me again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to join. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for taking some time from your schedule to uh, hang out and learn about um, uh, AppSec with me. Uh, very excited to have you here. Um, yeah, so scaling security program with SEMGREP. Let's uh, get into it. So uh, if you want, you can go uh, check out the slides via this uh, bit.ly URL. Um, these are just some Google slides um, that I'll uh, keep updated. So let's see. So basically today we're going to talk about a bunch of things, um, some big picture ideas and then some more uh, sort of actionable hands-on uh, demo exercises and challenges and things like that. Um, so we're going to learn a bit uh, about writing SEMGREP rules. We're going to show how you can uh, roll out secret scanning in uh, say five minutes. We're going to talk about uh, replacing say all the HTTP URLs in your code base with HTTPS and how to do that in sort of a fast iterative way. Uh, we'll also look at how to find all uh, unauthenticated routes in a code base because they may those may be sort of code hotspots you might want to manually audit. Um, and so I put some uh, sort of time expectations here because I think one of the unique selling points of SEMGREP is how quick it is to iterate and how it enables a uh, sort of a fast explorative uh, way of sort of prototyping rules. Um, <laughs> so maybe this is uh, claiming too much, but uh, I would rather uh, claim too much and uh, aim for it, then not shoot high enough. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is uh, if there are things specific to uh, your code base that you'd like to find, um, if you can like grab a quick reference to it and send it to me in a uh, semgrep.live link, which is sort of a playground where you can prototype uh, semgrep rules without installing anything, uh, please do that um, because I'd like to spend some time at the end just sort of live writing rules together uh, if there's something uh, you can give me an example of. So I think that that would be fun. Um, okay, so very quickly about me before we get into it. Um, so I'm the head of security research at R2C. We're a San Francisco-based security startup uh, aiming to profoundly improve software security. Um, before that, I was uh, a research director and technical director at NCC Group, which is a global security consulting firm. Uh, and before that, I was a uh, indentured servant slash uh, grad student at UC Davis. Uh, feel free to say hi on Twitter uh, if you'd like. Um, also, I have a security newsletter called TLDRSEC, which uh, I just spend uh, perhaps too much time reading uh, the best uh, blog posts, tool releases, uh, talks, and stuff like that, and condensing it down into one uh, sort of weekly newsletter that's free. So feel free to check that out uh, if you want. Um, OK, so this talk is basically two parts, uh, or a workshop, rather. So first, we're going to talk about some big picture ideas. And then we're going to get into the weeds uh, with SEMGREP, both uh, how it works and how to use it in practice. OK, so at a little more granularity, some of the big picture ideas we're going to be talking about are um, why secure defaults are much more powerful than focusing on finding bugs. Uh, the value of having uh, fast iteration speed in security. Um, this idea of static analysis as a fundamental capability uh, of your security program, not just this sort of bug finding black box that only has one use case. Uh, we'll talk about the power of customizing static analysis to your code. Um, and then we'll talk about some general static analysis best practices, like regardless of what tool you're using, regardless of um, how your company works. Like these are things that generally companies agree on as best practice. Um, and then for SEMGREP, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what is it? How did it come to be? How does it compare it to other things? We'll do a little um, intro rule writing uh, to teach you some of the core primitives that SEMGREP provides. Uh, we'll talk about some uh, flashy new features that have only been released uh, like this week and last week. So uh, some things that have never been talked about before that I'm super excited to share with you. Uh, and then we'll go into some more advanced demos of writing uh, custom rules. So, okay, cool. Let's uh, let's get into it. Um, okay. Also, um, <laughs> if some of this uh, early big picture ideas uh, are familiar to you, I've um, uh, created this uh, special challenge uh, based on uh, my friend Kurt had a had a cool example. Um, so let's see. I'm also going to tweet this uh, real fast. 
Um, let's see. So yeah, I uh, if you go here uh, and then like tweet a solution to this uh, to at Clint Gibbler on Twitter, or um, if you just go to at Clint Gibbler, um, it has a link to this as well, uh, or at least it should. Um, and yeah, it's uh, I would say it's um, not the hardest example, but it's not easy. So um, feel free to listen in or uh, try to solve that. Uh, okay, so um, why secure defaults are uh, much better than finding bugs. Um, and so this topic uh, is a bit nuanced and I uh, don't really have time right now to get into the full sort of details about in intuitively why is this the case and uh, you know how do you actually roll this out in practice. Um, that uh, is a lot of content and is actually uh, its own talk, which uh, I gave previously with my colleague Isaac at a uh, Global AppSec SF um, 2020. So if you want to uh, hear more about like why um, establishing uh, a paved road or secure guardrails is so powerful, and then how do you sort of step by step do this um, in your company, I encourage you to check out those slides. So I'm just going to take a, a couple of those things for this talk because I think it's so important. But if you really want to dive into this in more detail, I'd encourage you uh, to look at that. Sort of the core intuition here is that as a security team, our ultimate goal is reducing risk to the organization, right? So how can we empower our colleagues to build products that serves our customers uh, at an acceptable level of risk? So one way to reduce risk is finding all the bugs. However, that tends to be uh, impossible in practice. You know, there's always bugs. And if we try to find everything, it ends up being too noisy and drowning us in alerts. Uh, but many security teams are instead saying, hey, rather than doing that, why don't we just build a safe way to do something? Like, let's say this is how we parse XML, or this is how we handle uh, output encoding, and then just make sure everyone does that. Um, and then uh, you're sort of safe by default, and you only need to look for uh, places in your code where you're not doing this known safe way. And this is a much more tractable uh, and easy problem. So sort of the core intuition here is like detecting the use or lack of use of secure defaults is just much easier than finding bugs, but it's also more scalable uh, and effective. So I'm just going to give you like a couple of examples of what uh, people are saying in this space. So uh, a great talk by Scott and Isha of Netflix. Um, they talk about like here's how where we're investing uh, our AppSec team, and we can see secure by default is a core focus, and it's only growing uh, over time. Uh, Microsoft had a study where they found that in the transition from XP to Vista, basically banning dangerous functions resulted in a 41% vulnerability reduction, which is you know not too bad for just banning sort of uh, dangerous functions. Um, there's a great free book uh, by Google that you can just download from that link uh, called Building Secure and Reliable Systems, where they say it's unreasonable to expect a developer to be an expert in you know, all these nuances of security. A better approach is just to build common frameworks, libraries, uh, and languages that basically make writing certain classes of vulnerabilities impossible. Uh, Facebook has a great blog post uh, where basically they uh, say, here's all the different defense in depth ways we try to eliminate bugs. And sort of at the base of the pyramid, um, the thing they try to catch the most things with is secure frameworks, which is, um, you know, how do we build frameworks that make uh, preventing and removing entire classes of bugs uh, very easy? Um, here's an anecdote from a uh, very rapidly growing startup in the Bay Area. So a friend of mine was telling me uh, about what they do. Uh, and he said, you know, we were concerned about remote code execution in our Node.js apps. So we just banned <laughs> all the ways that this can happen in practice, like eval, new function, and so forth. Um, so they wrote ESLint plugins that basically just block the build if uh, any of these things are detected. Uh, and then they just didn't have to worry about these types of issues in Node.js apps. Uh, one quote he said that I thought was pretty funny is, uh, you can get amazing security wins if you can be a bit draconian about coding standards. And sort of the, the core idea here is, um, you know, how can we sort of work uh, with development teams to build things in a way that is sort of easier to analyze and easier to secure rather than letting them do just sort of willy-nilly whatever they want and then trying to sort of bolt on uh, security at, uh, at the end. So of course, this requires engineering team buy-in. Um, we really need to be uh, their partners and, and not sort of an external um, voice, uh, force that sort of is trying to change them from the outside. Uh, another blog post recently by uh, Dev, uh, a formerly a uh, grad student at Berkeley, used to be director of security engineering at Dropbox, now head of security at Figma. Um, he wrote this really great uh, blog post that I, I encourage you to read. Um, but basically, uh, he sort of summed up, I think, very well like what I believe and, and what I've been seeing a bunch of places, which is you know, these historical heavyweight slow tools focus on finding vulnerabilities, 
this is just fundamentally not the right path in modern development. You know, how do we instead uh, build tools that can just easily fit anywhere and are effective at enforcing secure code standards to sort of prevent vulnerabilities from happening in the first place? Uh, and again, we want sort of scalable, low noise ways to detect unsafe things like not even like, is this a vulnerability? Just is this say an unparameterized SQL query? Like user input may not be able to go there, but like, let's just always parameterize SQL queries and then we don't have to worry about it. Um, and again, uh, oftentimes these things are sort of specific to your company. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the value of iteration speed. Um, so uh, there's something uh, called the OODA loop or observe, orient, decide, act. Um, so this was originally created by uh, someone in the Air Force where basically the idea is like the faster you can be uh, aware of your surroundings, put things in context and then take action on them. Uh, if your sort of uh, OODA loop is faster than your uh, like the enemy um, fighter jet, like you're going to win uh, in that battle. Um, and similarly, uh, I think this idea actually uh, uh, is similar uh, a bunch of places, for example, uh, in agile development or startups, right? So why can uh, like a 10 person startup at some times build a product better than like this massive company? Well, it's because they have a faster loop, right? So they're building and shipping things quickly. They're getting customer feedback and uh, ultimately arriving at something um, that's better than someone that's uh, getting this feedback much slower. Um, so closer to security, we also see this in sort of blue team or incident response, right? So like if you can understand the attackers um, actions and how they're trying to spread and how they're trying to persist uh, faster, um, then they can sort of understand the environment and how you're changing it. Um, that's how you can contain and defeat them. Uh, conversely, if an attacker is better at orienting and, and changing uh, their tactics than you can as a defensive team, like it's very hard to kick them out and keep them out. Um, and I think, so the, the reason I say all this is because I think this also applies to uh, application security and, and product security. And um, the argument I want to make is uh, if you can iterate quickly, this fundamentally can alter how we work uh, and how we even think uh, about the problem space. So um, one thing I've seen a lot, and I am certainly uh, have done myself, is oftentimes when something uh, takes too long, um, you know, observe, orient, decide, act, like you're like, well, this is a lot of work, uh, why bother? But uh, if instead your feedback cycles are super quick, you can say like, okay, um, you know, we just got this bug bounty submission or I just found this bug. I wanna keep this from happening. Let me write a quick check. Okay, it wasn't quite right, but let me change it slightly. And it takes just like a minute or two. Like, okay, cool, this is pretty good. Let's roll it out everywhere. Um, and I'll show some examples of this later about how you can have an initial idea, uh, do it, and then just keep tweaking, tweaking, tweaking in just a couple of minutes. And I think um, in security tools and security infrastructure in general, I think this is an important idea to think like, how can we uh, make the process and methodology quick, easy, and something that um, has low enough friction that it's like, um, uh, I almost want to say just like pleasurable to, to improve. You're like, okay, yeah, like I, I can keep making this better and it's not so much friction that it just makes me want to stop. Um, okay. Clint, just a quick, yeah, yeah. Quick, a quick question. You know, on the OODA loop, have you looked at worldly maps? Worldly maps? Um, a little bit, not, uh, not too much yet. Uh, I've heard about them, but yeah. You know, the inspiration, to... one of the inspirations was the OODA loop. That's oh, the nice. first time I heard about it. So Simon Worley, the guy who created the, the, the Worley Maps, which is I highly recommend anybody here to go and take a look. And there's, there's a number of open security summit sessions around it. He, he, he walks and he has a, a whole framework that was initially again inspired. One of the things that he got inspired was by the OODA loop. So it has some really great stuff on it. So, uh, nice, yeah, I think I've heard of it, but I haven't uh, had time to look into it in detail yet. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the pointer. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, cool. Cool, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, cool. So let's talk about uh, static analysis as capability, not just a bug finding black box. Um, so this is later in uh, that article by Dev, uh, where he says, uh, working with static analysis tools today, it's not just a purely operational workflow. It's a creative endeavor where a security engineer is building on top of uh, the analysis engine. So uh, I think historically, many people think about static analysis as just like, OK, we put source code in, we get bugs out. Um, but I would encourage you to think more uh, about uh, not just static analysis, but just security in general. Like, how, 
how can we make this be sort of a fundamental capability that we can provide to our colleagues uh, outside of just security? Um, and this is really how I've seen um, security teams be successful at a, a number of different companies. So to give you an example, let's say uh, visibility for asset inventory. Um, you know, this is obviously useful for security. You need to know, you know, where's our code uh, hosted? Uh, what are all the servers uh, we have running in uh, Azure, AWS, whatever? Um, so that's like what we need to protect. Uh, but this is also very useful uh, getting visibility into your entire environment and how it changes over time for say DevOps and SRE teams. If things uh, start getting too slow or start failing, then they know um, where to start troubleshooting. Like finance might be curious about where are we spending all the money. Um, engineering teams care about, you know, okay, which teams own which services. Um, so this sort of fundamental primitive of visibility is useful for lots of teams. And I, I'd encourage you to think for all of um, security, like um, think about like how, what, a, what if this is useful to me and what is useful for other people, right? So let's say you have, you invest in um, source code analysis capabilities. Um, some non-security benefits of this for other teams could be, um, say for like a VP eng or CTO might care about like, how do we have consistent coding standards at scale? How do we keep code quality high everywhere? Um, if you want to do large scale code refactoring, for example, like we used to use this one API, now we use this new one, like automatically upgrading a bunch of places could be very valuable. Um, and oftentimes there's a lot of assumptions in code bases. And so helping onboard new developers saying like, hey, um, you know, this is the way we call this specific API. Um, all these things are just generally useful for um, engineering. So if you're like, hey, uh, I brought in these uh, tools that give you some security benefit, but also look at all these other things that you can uh, accomplish your goals with the tools I'm bringing in. So really, again, trying to be a, a partner to engineering teams. Um, OK, so the power of custom checks. Um, so out of the box, checks uh, are useful. Uh, generally, but they can be a bit noisy because they're not tailored to your code base. Um, but one thing I see across a bunch of companies is uh, like security checks that are specific to your company and how you write code often have uh, the biggest ROI. Um, so the reason is it tends to be high signal. So it's specific to how you write code um, and uh, sort of those coding conventions. Um, it's also a high impact because usually it's sort of tailored to things that your business cares about. Um, so for example, if you're like a HR healthcare firm, maybe you look for PII leaks, maybe um, uh, in like financial training institutions, you might look at like transferring money or things like that, like anything that can go wrong there, obviously super critical. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out that I think not a lot of people talk about is sort of business logic bugs, things that shouldn't happen in your app, um, generally aren't going to be covered by out of the box tools, whether that's SAS, DAST, or really just any security tool, because they don't have the context of how your application works and what is bad or what looks wrong uh, for your business. So uh, again, this is sort of the value of um, uh, creating checks tailored to your environment. Um, so a, a friend of mine um, had this story that I thought was pretty cool. So basically a bug bounty submission came in and it was like, hey, here's like an auth bypass. It was like pretty bad, not the worst. Um, but basically he was like, oh, this is a coding pattern that I feel like I've seen a bunch of places. So he wrote a quick check that looked at sort of the generic case of that. And he found a separate uh, auth bypass that was much more severe, um, like an hour later. So again, because this auth bypass is like not something uh, an existing tool can find out of the box because it's never seen your code, it doesn't know how it works. Um, I think this, again, rapid proto prototyping and tailing to your code base, uh, super valuable. Um, OK, sort of last thing, just some general best practices. Um, if you're going to choose a static analysis tool, regardless of what you choose, these are the questions uh, I would ask. So uh, does it support the programming languages my company uses? And not just language, but also probably framework. So if you use Spring or Django or Rails or something like that, um, I would look for that. Um, tools can be better or worse at different languages and frameworks. So keep that in mind. Um, if you have a custom in-house framework that isn't open source, like most of the time, uh, you're going to get mediocre results, in my experience, unless you're willing to invest in tuning it. Um, is it easy to hook into whatever CI you use? So whether that's GitHub Actions and so forth. Uh, are you going to have to manage a server that's running the tool? Uh, is it going to get access to my source code? How expensive is it? And is it easy to extend and customize? Um, again, mentioned before, but you know, custom rules can be very high ROI. 
Uh, and in terms of like rolling static analysis out in your company, say you like don't do it now, but you would like to do it. Um, I kind of think of this as like two parallel tracks of things you can do. So one is um, sort of to start offline, like maybe we do a full scan of every repo to understand the current state of the world. What are the vulnerabilities that exist? Um, you could start doing some uh, analysis, like what vulnerability classes are most prevalent and make a game plan to uh, educate developers, maybe have internal coding guidelines, uh, building some secure guardrails. Uh, for example, let's say your company has lots of XSS. You're like, okay, cool. Well, what frameworks do we use? How do we do output encoding consistently in those? Uh, and then roll that out everywhere. Uh, and again, sort of the goal here is how do we solve classes of bugs, not just sort of play what off bug whackable because that's not very scalable over time. Um, and then sort of in parallel or after you can start rolling out checks continuously in CI. Um, so first I would encourage you to just do like a few high signal checks. Don't try to boil the ocean or there might be so many alerts that uh, you drown in them a bit. So you can say, um, okay, like we have a bunch of historical issues, like that's okay. Um, let's stop new things from being introduced. Um, if you're going to start prototyping some things, I'd encourage you to work with uh, engineering or development teams you're closest with. Um, as you're rolling out new security checks, you can first uh, like notify the security team, but maybe don't even show it to developers. Then over time, if you see uh, that the things it's finding are high signal, then you can maybe comment on the pull request or merge request. And then eventually, if you're very confident, you can uh, block the build. But I would encourage you to only do that if you're like 95% or more uh, sure that something that it's finding uh, is actually uh, an issue. Um, again, sort of maybe focus on one or two vulnerability classes first. Things, uh, vulnerabilities that you find via pen test or bug bounty, maybe you can write some custom rules to target those, make sure those don't happen again. Uh, and again, this allows you to find other variants of those. Um, so a pen test may find one or two of a specific type of bug. But if you look at what's common uh, between those, you might be able to find like 10 others that they uh, weren't able to find due to uh, limited time. Uh, and again, by rolling this out in CI, like sort of security integration tests, you can prevent this from happening in the future. Um, so the goal here is like, how can we raise our organization security bar just sort of one inch at a time. It doesn't have to go from uh, zero to perfect, but just incrementally just raise the bar over time. And um, this can be uh, sort of compoundingly useful. Um, okay, cool. So let's uh, get into uh, the more sort of like actionable and uh, detailed part. Um, so first, uh, we'll do a little bit of like overview of static analysis in general and sort of uh, how SEMGRIP came to be. Um, then we'll get into rule writing. Um, and do some like hands-on sort of lab stuff. Then we'll take a brief break to talk about some new features um, and then we'll get into some more advanced demos. So, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so today we're gonna be talking about SEMGRIP. Uh, it's on GitHub. You can install it via uh, PIP or Homebrew or Docker, things like that. Uh, it's a lightweight static analysis tool for many languages designed to find bugs as well as enforce coding standards. Um, so why is it useful for security consultants and uh, researchers? So it's open source, uh, LJPL, uh, many other tools that are similarly powerful are closed source and have you know, limitations around uh, when you can run them. Uh, it supports many languages. So rather than uh, using you know, N tools for N languages, um, I think we support like nine plus languages now and constantly growing. Uh, there's over a thousand out of the box security checks uh, across a bunch of languages. Um, one key thing is it does not require buildable source code. So when I was a security consultant, oftentimes I got source code that was not uh, buildable, which sort of precluded the use of other tools, but that's not a problem with SEMGRIP. It operates on source code directly. Um, and then lastly, I think the key differentiator is um, patterns uh, basically look like the code uh, you're targeting. Um, so if you can read, say, Java source code, you can write uh, rules uh, in SEMGRIP for Java. Um, okay, so why is it nice for if you're like internal security people or developers? Um, oftentimes there's like uh, coding standards that are documented on a wiki or just in your brain or in uh, the code. And um, you want to like enforce that continuously. And I think SEMGREP uh, is the um, best tool I've seen for taking an idea that's in your head and uh, codifying it as a check. Um, so this maybe uh, is going to be a bit too aggressive to claim, but I will do it anyway. Um, I would say after spending a few hours learning SEMGREP, um, basically any task you would like to do, um, if it is expressible within SEMGREP, like if it's possible to connote that coding pattern, 
you will probably be able to figure out how to do that in like an hour or two. So after some upfront learning, that's not too much. Uh, I would say uh, almost all the time, um, you'll be able to create a rule that codifies sort of your intention. And it may not be perfect, but I think it'll be uh, pretty good in practice. Um, OK, so some use cases, maybe help new developers get up to speed faster. So you can have checks that say, hey, you're writing code like this, but you should be writing it uh, like this. So again, helping uh, engineering teams, how do we ship higher quality code more quickly, uh, enforcing code quality standards uh, from the security point of view. Um, if you have a you know, bug bounty or pen test bugs, like preventing similar bugs like that from entering in the future, um, finding bugs across a variety of vulnerability classes, and again, like how can we as a security team provide valuable capabilities to our developer customers? Um, so I put this here just because I want you to think about that, not just in this space, but really just in general. Um, this is something I see time and time again across modern uh, security teams. So uh, where does SimGrep fit in and sort of static analysis in general? Uh, static analysis is not like a binary yes or no, you're doing it or you're not doing it. There's actually like a range in complexity. Um, so on the simple side, uh, we have regexes, which are not aware of source code structure. They're just looking at strings. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we have whole program analysis, which is doing sort of complex data flow across, say, th hundreds or thousands of files. Um, SimGrep is basically in the middle, where we're trying to take the best from both worlds, where you know it's uh, fast and intuitive, but also has some powerful capabilities, but is not as sort of slow and noisy. Um, so in every tool, there's a, sort of a worldview of like, what perspective uh, led you to make the design decisions you did. So I just wanted to like quickly be clear about ours. Um, so we focus very much on speed. So we think that uh, repo should be scanned in minutes, not hours or days. Uh, false negatives are better than false positives. So if you're really trying to scale um, security, then you want um, uh, ideally like very high signal things, even if it's okay if you like miss a few things here and there. Um, Ease of use is key. So there's a lot of value in org specific and code base specific checks. We heavily prioritize first time user experience or sort of average users. We want basically anyone to be able to use SEMGREP competently, not people who uh, have spent you know hundreds of hours using it or have some sort of academic background. Uh, we want it to be accessible to developers, not just security professionals. So one thing uh, that we've seen at a couple of companies is um, security teams will sort of bring SEMGREP into the company but um, the developer productivity team or the CTO or someone like that is like, oh, cool. Like I can use this for my purposes. This is great. Um, and then lastly, talked about this before, but enforcing secure defaults is greater than bug finding. Um, so given these design decisions, what, what uh, do we decide to do? So first we Wait, focus uh, on- Chris, oh, yeah, a, yeah. To the question that um, JSJ, GSJ asked here, uh, how does SimGrep help you developers on developers newly onboarded to a code base? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's say there is um, like a standard library function that is like common for say Python developers to use. But in your organization, the engineering team has said, OK, this is the way that we want to do that. Um, we have like our internal wrapper for say opening a file because we want to like log which file was opened and how much was written or something like that. So there's something that someone new to the company wouldn't do that way. Um, you could write a SEMGREP rule to say, hey, every time you're like say opening a file using standard lib rather than our custom internal wrapper, just like write a PR comment that says, hey, looks like you're using open, but you should be using like Acme Corp open or something like that. Um, yeah, so basically like Imagine all of the sort of um, uh, domain expertise or business logic uh, assumptions that exist within your organization. You can like codify those into basically lints that run uh, on every pull request. Um, so that's one example. Another example might be, um, you know, we have this one. Um, if it's like a financial trading application, we might say like anytime someone uh, makes a transaction, we need to call this verify function on that transaction object first before doing that. Like you could imagine some business logic assumption about the order of API calls. Um, and again, you could codify that in like a SEMGREP lint to say, hey, if you're calling this function, make sure that this property holds over one of its arguments or make sure this other API call is, is called first or, or something like that. Um, yeah, does that uh, answer your question? Um, JSJ, maybe unmute or just put a message on the on the chat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's good. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, 
Cool. So uh, given these design decisions, um, like what uh, choices did we make? So we focus on sort of single file and localized analysis. Uh, Interprocedural data flow uh, tends to be more slow and imprecise. Uh, it's generally not required for enforcing secure defaults. And um, this uh, doesn't require us uh, to have buildable source code. So we are actually considering building sort of more advanced cross-file analysis, but that's not the focus right now. Um, and uh, we have rules that look like source code. So this makes it very easy to write, but can be um, uh, not quite as Turing complete as like a full programming language. Um, OK, cool. So just briefly, like how do all these things uh, fit together? Um, so SEMGRIP works like basically uh, most other static analysis tools work, which is um, you go from source code, you parse it into an abstract syntax tree or sort of like a graph structure. You've got your security checks. You combine those together, do some pattern matching, and then out comes uh, security bugs. So at a high level, if you were to draw like a simplistic model of like any static analysis tool, it probably works like this. Um, so we also have a, a Docker container called SEMGREP agent um, that's also on GitHub and is free. Uh, but basically, like if you want to run SEMGREP CLI in uh, a continuous integration, you probably want it to be like diff aware. You want it to be able to like write merge requests or PR comments or things like that. So this just makes that easy. Um, oh, sorry. I think I heard someone uh, screenshot. So I'll quickly go back so that you can do that. Um, also, these slides are uh, available. Um, so basically, like how how does this compare to other tools? So um, it, some groups rules are open source um, as our code QL, which I think is great. Uh, but also its engine is open source. I think um, that's a differentiator. You can also run it freely on closed source repos uh, as much as you want. Um, you never have to talk to us. Um, we do have a, a SaaS app that is not um, open source um, uh, because hopefully uh, this is how uh, we make money. Um, so basically, we have a dashboard that I'll show you. There's also a, a free community edition that you don't have to talk to us. You can just sign up and use it and use most of the functionality, never pay us, never talk to us. But basically, the idea is you have a bunch of repos. You have some grep scanning and CI on all of them, and then it sort of collects the results uh, and displays them. Um, so basically, why did we build it? Um, we found that uh, we were focusing on the CLI tool, and a bunch of companies were just building the same thing, um, which is if you're running some grep on hundreds of repos, you probably care about you know what you're scanning where. So you want to say, like, hey, all my Rails apps, I want to scan with this. All my production apps, I want to scan with that. Um, you might want a dashboard with some like metrics and trends, see if things are actually getting fixed or not, um, have integrations so every time you find something, or maybe a weekly report, uh, an email or Slack, pull request comments, webhook notifications, like blah, blah, blah. Basically, like after three to five companies built their own, you're like, well, we should probably save people the work. Um, if you're thinking about comparing this to sort of other standard SaaS to web apps, um, your code stays in your CI systems, so we don't upload it to us, which some other tools do. Um, also, there's no separate infrastructure to set up, maintain, or run um, because we just use your existing CI environment. Um, but if you want to roll your own, like you totally can. Some companies do. Um, I will say getting like diff aware scanning uh, is a surprising amount of engineering work, uh, as well as like PR comments, integrations, whatever. Like, yeah, you can build it, but you'll have to maintain it and like, eh, it's up to you. Do, do what you want. Um, if you'd like, there's also a VS Code extension where you can point at uh, a SEMGRIP rules to get feedback uh, right in your IDE. Um, if you'd like to put uh, SEMGRIP in CI, there's basically some stubs for a bunch of different tools. Um, but again, SEMGRIP is just uh, like a CLI tool that outputs JSON or Serif, the static analysis interchange format or other things. So it's pretty easy to fit um, almost anywhere in my experience. Um, there's also a registry where we'll take a look at a second that um, uh, with like, again, uh, I think uh, over a thousand uh, community contributed rules. Um, OK, so yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, any uh, questions so far? Or additional questions so far? I think the other question was the link to the slides. And if you can share also the link, yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or you send. 
send it to, to us. We, we we can put it also on the on the page with that has the video. And, and by the way, I think somebody asked, you know, we we will publish the videos uh, later on. In fact, actually, can you actually it's not there? Can you can you share it? You know the the on on Google there on file. You know, if you go to file uh, uh, on uh, yeah this one or file but on, on the left on the left. If you go file and then you go publish to the web, right? And then if you oh. yeah hmm. if, interesting if you go publish, yeah, and then you can if you paste that link because uh, you want a selection that should be the whole thing, right? Yeah, I I I, I can if you, if you share that link with I'll put it on the chat right if you want then. You can use that one for. Uh, I can embed that on the um, on the Open Security Summit site. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Um, Just put down the chat for the for Zoom, and then I I can add it. Cool. Yeah. So that looks like the embed, and here's just the uh, the direct link from uh, Google Slides. Yeah. But cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for asking. Um, yeah, happy to share. Um, yeah, feel free to uh, share this however you like. Um, cool. So um, yeah, so just getting into it a bit. So I created a um, intro to SimGrep uh, GitHub Learning Lab, which basically takes you through uh, onboarding uh, the Juice Shop repo um, uh, into sort of continuous scanning with GitHub Actions. and. Um, It's a, it, it has some useful capabilities. Um, we'll, we'll see them, we'll work through some of it together. But I would um, maybe caution you against using GitHub Learning Lab. So um, I spent uh, a fair amount of time learning to use it. And um, I found that there were like, some subtle errors that made using it um, not great. So I think mostly it's fine to use an existing one. Um, but I would just sort of you know beware here of the dragons if, um, if you want to build your own. But, if you do plan to build your own, uh, reach out to me and I'll send you a list of like 10 subtle errors that you're probably going to make that uh, it won't tell you about and you'll just be sad. Um, so yeah, so let's, um, I guess, do like a, a quick overview of some things we talked about to, to make it real. And then we'll uh, walk through onboarding SendGrep in CI. Then we will um, write some custom rules uh, and so forth. OK, so uh, this is SendGrep.dev. This is the landing page. Um, one thing that's pretty cool is uh, we created this little widget. Um, so this is actually a, a sort of mini SEMGREP editor in an iframe. So this is a SEMGREP rule. And this is some test code uh, that it's going to match. Um, <laughs> so this is, uh, I think SEMGREP is the only tool I know that has a embeddable static analysis iframe. Um, you can't, unfortunately, put it anywhere. We need to fix our sort of the uh, um, X-frame option settings to allow like non-R2C domains, but hopefully soon uh, that'll work. But um, so you can actually click Run here, um, and uh, it'll flag this line of code. Um, yeah. So basically, um, I'm going to go into more detail in a second. But SimGrep rules are just YAML. Um, so here, this is like the ID of the rule. Uh, it runs on Python. This is a message that we would show to the user. The pattern is just uh, look for any call to print. Uh, this dot, dot, dot is the ellipsis operator, which basically abstracts away, like, I don't care what the arguments are, match anything. Um, so the severity is just info. So here we have a print, uh, and we don't care what the argument is. Um, so that's why uh, this pattern uh, is flagging this line of code. Um, and we'll, we'll get into other examples uh, in a second. Um, another thing. Uh, that's exciting is if you um, use GitLab um, in the GitLab 14.0 uh, release happening, um, I believe next week, um, they're actually ripping out several uh, of their built-in static analysis tools, uh, ESLint and Bandit, and replacing them with SendGrep. So GitLab's plan is to eventually take like the 10 tools they're already using and replace all of them uh, with SendGrep. So GitLab has, I think, about 30% of the code hosting market. So anyone uh, using GitLab who opts into the GitLab SAST 
uh, will be running SEMgrep under the hood. Um, so yeah, over the next couple of months, uh, it'll be cool to have SEMgrep running on uh, approximately 30% uh, of uh, code hosting uh, providers, uh, provided you've opted into static analysis. So uh, this is not like uh, a secret, uh, but the, we haven't uh, sort of broadcasted this yet. So you uh, friends at Open Security Summit are some of the first to know. So, um, okay, so um, SEMgrep is on GitHub. Uh, feel free to uh, check out the source code there. Um, if you want to see uh, the uh, rules that we've written for it, you can see a whole bunch of examples here. Um, but uh, it's a little bit nicer to view the rules uh, in your browser. So if you go to semgrep.dev and click on rules, uh, we have a bunch of uh, rule sets that we've created, which sort of bundle rules for you. Um, so here, um, some OWASP top 10 issues. Um, so all rules sort of focusing on those. Uh, here's like a tailored set of high signal things for CI. Um, this is like a more broad set of security checks. Um, so we talked a lot about uh, secure guardrails so far, and this is something we've really leaned into. So we've tried to sort of target specific vulnerability classes like uh, command injection or XSS or like what are all the ways to talk not over HTTPS like insecure transport and then some other classes of things like secret detection, JWT and so forth. So um, our goal is to figure out like what are the ways to not do the right thing for every language and framework and then just make it very easy to, to check for that. Um, if you have like a specific language or framework, we've collected a bunch of rules for those. Um, while we focus on source code, you can actually use SEMgrep on uh, basically any type of file, any text file you can use SEMgrep. Um, so here's some like Docker Compose, Docker File, Terraform, and so forth. Um, so I would say we're not yet as uh, effective at infrastructure's code scanning as tools that only do that because they can largely like um, uh, interpret variables and like do like cross file things. So uh, SEMgrep will be able to do that eventually, but I would say as of today, um, not as well. Um, but it's kind of cool that you can use one tool for a, a variety of things. Um, we've also gradually started porting um, security rules from other open source tools. So rather than running, say, Node.js scan, FindSec bugs, GoSec, and other tools, you can actually run one tool and get most of the same uh, security benefit. Um, but uh, if you're curious about what we have and um, don't want to just use a pre-built rule set, you can go to search and you know, filter by language, um, by category, um, technology, uh, and so forth. Um, so let's say you're like, okay, well, I care about like Python um, and um, say security, and I don't know, maybe you care about like XSS or something. So you can see relevant rule sets as well as like specific rules for uh, those security checks if you think click on this maybe you can see like what actually is the raw um, YAML you can uh, see like the test cases um, and if you want to see this in like a bigger view um, you can click on this so this takes you to the SEMgrep playground which is basically a way to uh, run uh, SEMgrep in your browser without installing anything so here's basically the, uh, the security check and then Here's um, some unit test code that uh, we create and include with every SEMgrep rule to say, um, you know, this is what should match, this is what should not match. So um, one thing that's cool about this is um, you can make sure that your rules match the code that you're intending to match um, by uh, just saying like, hey, here's like a couple of functions. This function should match, this function should not match, or this call should match, and so forth. Um, okay, so I think. That's um, sort of like most most of the high level stuff. Um, I also just wanted to point out our docs. Um, so we spend a lot of time on docs. Um, so if you're curious about how something works, um, I would encourage you to check this out. So if you want to say, I don't know, like integrations, um, generally there's like a lot of info on probably whatever you're curious about. Um, but in terms of like writing rules, I would say uh, these two are probably the most helpful. So um, this is like, here's what you can do within one sort of SEMgrep 
pattern. Um, and then here's how you can like combine patterns to say like, I want to match this and that or this, but not that, um, things like that. Um, OK, cool. So I feel like uh, I spent too much time talking about it, and I want to get into it. But any um, sort of high level questions uh, so far? Not going to be good. OK, cool. So let's see. If you want to go, um, let's see. I'll paste this in chat. Um, Yeah, so this is a GitHub Learning Lab I created. Um, uh, basically, what it's going to do is when you click Start, it's going to fork a repo into your uh, user account, and um, it, which is basically just a copy of Juice Shop with some additional um, uh, like branches and additional code I've added for like exercise purposes. And it's basically going to talk you through a series of exercises. Like first, how do we get some grep set up? How do we add it to CI? Let's write a rule together. Let's like audit routes and let's like scan for secrets. Um, so let's uh, let's walk through a couple of those together. Um, so basically, if you go to the root of this repo, um, this is uh, this is just Juice Shop. Uh, as I said, it's just forked. But the what the Learning Lab does is it creates a series of pull requests. And then um, like as you do actions, it sort of observes them and then responds. Um, so here, um, there's some sort of explanatory text. Um, but basically, like what this bot is going to do is say, hey, uh, when you write a comment, I'm going to assume you've done the things that I asked you to do. And I'll give you the next step. Um, so. Uh, you can type whatever you want in here. And sometimes the response will auto show up. Sometimes you'll need to refresh. So if you wait like three seconds and you don't see it, um, just uh, just refresh the page. Um, so again, GitHub Learning Lab can be a, a little bit of wonkiness. Um, OK, so the first thing uh, it's going to ask you to do is set up Slack notifications um, for SEMGREP, so the reason why is um, uh, if you want sort of continuous notification about like findings uh, on different repos and different PRs, this is a good way to do it. Um, you can also do email uh, and other things like that. So just to save us time in the workshop, I've already done these steps, but um, we can see uh, what the uh, SimGrip uh, cloud or what the dashboard looks like. So. Um, there's like an overview page. Uh, this is just a test account, so there's not uh, a ton of info here. I can show you what like a real one looks like later. Um, projects is basically here's all of the um, uh, repos that you've onboarded onto scanning with SEMGREP. Um, policies are basically like what security checks do you want to happen where. So by default, SEMGREP comes with two. So one is um, checks that uh, should happen and just asynchronously notify you but not block the build. So this is a great place to put things that like things you want to know about but um, aren't necessarily um, something you want to stop developer progress. And then there's this other policy that is uh, blocking the build. So if there's something that you're very confident about that you want to make sure doesn't get merged in, um, you can put something like this uh, there. Um, let's see. Then there's like a findings page where over time you can see here's different security issues that have been found. Um, integrations, um, if you want to set up Slack or email or things like that, you can do that here. Um, and that's most of it. Um, so, okay, let's configure this repo to start scanning uh, with some grep and CI in uh, just like uh, about like two minutes. Um, okay, so Slack just for time. I set this up beforehand. So let's uh, keep going. Um, OK, so let's see. Let's set up some grep in CI. So we're going to go to the projects page, click uh, add CI job to GitHub project. 
Oh, I guess um, I already added the um, subgroup GitHub app, so it's uh, it sees uh, this repo. Um, so basically, uh, what's going to happen is we wanted to make it as easy as possible to uh, onboard new repos. So um, by clicking commit file, basically, we're going to create this GitHub action workflow file. Um, and you can say, like, do we want to scan pull requests? Uh, do we want to scan pushes? Um, if so, which branches? Um, do we want to block the build or not? Uh, and things like that. So you can sort of tweak these things, and it'll update the SimGrep config uh, that will be written. Um, so if we do commit, yeah. So we need to tell SimGrep, like, um, you know, this is the scanning policy that we should uh, pull in. So uh, what we're going to do is set up a, a GitHub secret. So this is basically just telling um, when the GitHub action spins up, um, it's going to basically, uh, the Docker container is going to say, oh, OK, cool. This is your token. Let me reach out to um, the SimGrip dashboard and say, hey, what rule should I run? Um, and then it'll run those. And there's uh, some pretty nice properties of that that we will uh, talk about in a second. Um, OK, so that was all it took. That file um, should be pushed now. Let's see. Yeah, so we can see that um, we've added this. Uh, semgrep.yaml workflow file, which basically says, you know, this is what to scan on push. Um, you know, run this Docker container and just sort of pull in this semgrep secret that we've added, just so that uh, semgrep knows, you know, which uh, which one we are. Um, okay, so let's see. We've already set this up, so let's move on uh, to the next step. Um, okay, cool. So now uh, let's get into um, some rule writing. Um, let's see. So uh, again, there's like more text here. I'm obviously not going to read it to you now, but I wanted to make this self-contained. So if you go through this uh, on your own, you can uh, do that easily. Um, so I talk a little bit about like the UI and sort of what the rule uh, syntax looks like. Um, but yeah, so let's do that ourselves. Um, OK, so let's write uh, some SimGrep rules together. Um, so let's say there is a function uh, in our code base that is uh, we know to be dangerous. Um, so let's just call it, uh, say, my eval. Um, so the reason I didn't use just eval is because that's like a, a known thing that um, tools would handle out of the box, but let's say there's something custom to your organization. So we want to find uh, all calls to my eval. Um, so I have a bunch of test cases here. So we can see it's called with uh, some variable, some string literal. Maybe it's called in like a uh, conditional um, and just a bunch of different places. So quickly, we can see this would be pretty annoying to grep for because this is on multiple lines. There's like some white space. Um, Maybe there's some comments, or it's called in like a string literal. Uh, and ideally, we would not want to flag those things, because that's going to uh, be pretty annoying. Um, so basically, in SimGrep, if we wanted to find uh, my eval with exactly this argument, uh, we could do this. And by clicking the Run button, um, it'll find just that. But Maybe we want to find my eval with any argument, uh, and we don't care what it is. Like any argument could be potentially dangerous. So um, SimGrip allows us to abstract that away with the ellipsis operator, which is just a dot, dot, dot. So this is going to find any call to my eval uh, regardless of the arguments. Um, let's see. So if we do that. So notice, so unlike grep, 
we did not flag uh, this one right here because that's a function definition, not a function call. But we did flag this with um, a variable as an argument uh, or a string literal or in a conditional or here inside and white space didn't trip us up. Uh, but we did not flag this because it's a comment. We did not flag this because it's in a string. Um, so it's not actually a function call uh, and so forth. Um, OK, so, so the ellipsis operator uh, will match zero or more arguments. Um, but let's say we want to uh, catch a sort of like a, a reference to something um, that we're matching. Let's say um, sort of like a, so I guess compared to regular expressions, the ellipsis operator is sort of like dot star. Whereas um, uh, if we want to do like a capture group uh, in a regular expression, but in uh, SEMGREP, we call those meta variables, which is a dollar sign and then sort of an all caps identifier. Um, so if we do a dollar sign X here, uh, this is going to match um, both of these, but it's not going to match these two anymore because here um, there's no arguments for my eval. And because we said dollar sign X, that assumes there's at least one argument. Well, actually, it assumes there's exactly one argument. So that's why this doesn't match, because there's several. Um, but it does match these, because there's only one argument. Um, so let's see. So let's say we wanted to say something like there are um, one or more arguments. We could do something like this. So combining a meta variable and ellipsis together says, OK, there's uh, at least one argument, and we're going to match that first argument to x. And then there could be zero or more arguments after that. Um, and if we go to this advanced tab, we can see the rule that we're uh, actually writing. Um, the simple UI is just like a nice wrapper around it. So we can say we matched uh, whatever this meta variable is. And so we can, uh, in the message, interpolate anything matched in uh, the patterns. So if we do this, oh, yeah, yeah, because I had a, uh, it doesn't like that because this is YAML. So we're just going to split this onto a new line. Um, cool. So we can see here in our messages that this uh, dollar sign x is matching some bar, and we can see that here. We can see that it's matching ls, and that's here. Um, so we did not match this because there's no arguments. We did match this now because there is uh, one or more because of the ellipsis operator. Um, and we can see that it matched a here. Um, let's see. So if we wanted to say something like, let's match only the um, my eval where the first argument is a string literal. We could do that. Um, so that's not matching this because it's a variable, but it is matching this, which is a uh, hard coded string. Um, and I think, yeah, the rest of these are variables, so it doesn't match any of those. Um, if you, one thing that's uh, common is you might want to match only when something is not a hard coded string. Um, because oftentimes, you know, if something is a string literal, it's a user can't influence it, so it's not dangerous. Um, so this is pretty easy uh, as well. Um, so we could say any call to my eval where there's at least one argument, and uh, we can say and it's not my eval um, first argument string literal, and then uh, zero or more arguments after that. Um, so, so far, we've mostly been doing uh, like a single clause semgrep pattern, uh, which is nice and can be very powerful. But we also sometimes want to say, find this, but not that, or find this, or that, or that, um, or this, but not that, and sort of like a Boolean composition. Um, and semgrep allows you to do that with uh, multiple clauses. So you can add a, a subset of things here, um, but you can also um, uh, do even more things uh, in the advanced mode because there's additional pattern operators that aren't exposed in the uh, simple editor. Um, so if we were to, uh, oh yeah, 
So it's sort of moved this back up on one line, um, which would cause it to fail. Um, let's see. So if we look now, so we're saying find uh, any call to my eval where the um, first argument is not a string uh, literal. So we're matching this, not this. There's a, no argument, so we're not matching that. This is not a string literal or this uh, or this. Um, cool. So there's a lot more we could do, but I think, uh, to be honest, even though this has been a pretty short description, uh, you now know maybe 50 to 80% of SEMRIP. Um, so basically, if you want to match zero or more arguments or statements or something like that, you can use the ellipsis operator. If you would like to sort of match one specific thing, you can use a, a meta variable. Um, you can use multiple meta variables if you want. Um, you can combine these things arbitrarily. Uh, but yeah, that's like the core fundamentals. Um, so yeah, any uh, questions so far? And we'll go through a bunch of other examples. But this is sort of, uh, I wanted to uh, encapsulate sort of the core things in, a, in this short little uh, blurb. No, I think we're good. I don't see anything on the chat. OK, cool. Um, let's see. So let's um, go back to here. Um, so I'm going to Oh, and uh, yeah, looks like I had uh, previously solved this exercise. Um, so uh, I'm not going to solve most of these things now with you because I want to um, leave them uh, for you to do later because um, that could be fun. Um, so I'm just going to quickly um, go through uh, a couple of the next exercise things to sort of actually skip to the last one and then do um, some uh, hands-on uh, demo um, stuff uh, based on um, like a repo that I've just cloned locally because I want to show you not just like rolling uh, a SEMGRIP out in CI, but also um, like how you can take an iterative approach to run rules locally and like uh, explore a new code base you've never seen before. Um, okay, so this is the message after we wrote um, the uh, my eval rule. Um, here's like some more advanced pattern stuff. Um, so there's some couple exercises here on how to like automatically extract routes from juice shop and look for ones that aren't doing any uh, auth. Um, so I think that's interesting. Um, but I would rather leave that uh, for you to do um, on your own. Um, because uh, one thing that I do want to show you is sort of the uh, the process of finding uh, secrets. So that's uh, this last exercise that I just added um, last night. Um, OK, so sort of the point of this exercise is I want to show you two things. Um, so one, like how do we add uh, existing rules or rule sets to our scanning policy? And then the second is, let's say there's uh, some custom uh, secret uh, that you would like to find that doesn't come out of the box. Like maybe it's specific to your application. Maybe it's specific to an uh, API or service that not um, a lot of other people use. Um, so we'll we'll look at sort of two things. Like how do we set up secret scanning? And then um, how uh, do we sort of create like a custom secret detection? Um, so we'll do both of those in, uh, I think, like five minutes. Um, let's see. So. Let's say we want to add um, secret scanning to our uh, repo. Um, so basically, here's how we would do it. Um, so assuming we already have SEMGREP set up in CI, the process is basically this. So you could go to the registry and say, um, OK, cool, secrets or any of these. This is uh, some uh, security checks I would like. Um, we can see we've got 44 uh, secret checks. This is how you could run it locally if you want to. Here's um, sort of the specific things that are being checked for. And uh, But what I want to call to your attention is um, uh, this add to policy button. So 
basically, if you come across uh, a rule or rule set that you want to add to the things you're scanning SEMGRIP with in CI, um, basically, all you have to do is click this and then click uh, on one of these uh, existing policies that you already have. And uh, what's going to happen is uh, SEMGRIP is going to take all of the rules currently here in scope, add them to one of these policies, and then any repo you have uh, being scanned with those policies are just automatically on the next PR or the next push uh, are going to be scanned with what you just did. Um, so what's pretty cool about this is let's say you have like 100 or like 1,000 repos that you want to say like, oh, um, I should really start scanning for secrets in these. Um, all you would have to do is go to this page, click this button, click on whatever policy that's applying to the repos and scope that you want, um, and then literally that's it. And then on the next PR or the next whatever sort of thing you've set it on, uh, you're going to start getting that security coverage. Um, so one, I think, des design decision here that's important to call out is um, the value of having a centrally managed place to determine uh, what gets scanned, which repos get scanned with which rules. Um, so one thing that we've seen is, let's say that you have a, um, a local file in a repo. Um, so let's say, uh, and this is common with tools like, say, Breakman or Bandit or tools like that, um, where it's like, OK, in this repo, we're going to say, these are the security checks to run. Uh, that's fine. But what happens is, let's say you have 10, 50, or 100 repos, each have a config file that says, these are the security checks to run. Then if you want to add something new, then you need to do like 100 PRs to 100 repos to update what's being scanned, because uh, the, the what's defining the rules to scan with is in uh, version control centrally in each of those repos. So anytime you want to update, like remove something or add something, you have to do a bunch of PRs to a bunch of repos. So the value of having like a separate application lets you arbitrarily change, um, you know, take this rule out, it's too noisy, add this rule because this is important. We just found this in bug bounty. You can uh, basically update scanning policy across hundreds or thousands of repos. Uh, transparently to developers. You don't need them to accept uh, PRs from you. Um, so this can make rolling out and changing uh, like hundreds of times easier and faster. Um, let's see. So um, I created this exercise, and then uh, I didn't realize at the time that our built-in policies actually already include, already include secret scanning. Um, so we can see here um, that we found a, a Slack webhook. Um, we found some uh, like AWS account IDs um, and things like that. Um, oh, oops. Uh, I left in my rule for uh, detecting custom uh, APIs. OK, so let's, um, this is the uh, problem for practicing your demo beforehand. Let's say where. Let's uh, remove this rule from our policy. Let's see, I wonder if I can delete this comment. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, so let's let's say we're um, doing some code review, um, and we were like, oh. Hey, there's um. We found this like secret that's like kind of interesting. Um, it doesn't look like we're currently flagging it, so maybe that's something that we want to do. Um, and we see uh, another example of it here. Um, so again, this is just like a custom secret format that I just made up because I wanted to show the process of like identifying something that you want to find, writing a custom check for it, and then rolling it out. Uh, everywhere. So, okay. So let's say we look at this and we're like, okay, so the token looks like it starts with like custom API and then it has like 10 digits. So that's like pretty easy to regex for. So um, what we could do is, uh, and I created sort of a helper link here for you. Um, so let's say we copy the structure of an existing secret detection rule into uh, a new thing. Um, OK, so here 
we are uh, writing a regex rule. We have like a pre-populated message. We have um, some uh, examples of what we'd like to find here. So uh, what we can do is say like, okay, what is something that's gonna match both of these? Um, probably something that's like starts with custom API and then uh, let's say is like numbers and let's say about 10 of them because that's sort of the, the format I've made up here. But again, uh, this could be any secret format or this could be any sort of a code pattern you're looking to find. Um, okay, so we wrote a check, but let's like make sure that it actually works. Um, the way you can do that is by um, this sort of annotation where you can do a comment and then rule ID colon and then whatever this is. So these two match. Um, so this is basically saying this rule ID, I expect to match this next line of code. Um, so if we run this, let's see if I can remember how regexes work. Cool. Okay. So we found both of these things. It seems to be flagging the things from, uh, from here. So I just sort of copied those into the, uh, that test, the test file here. Um, so cool. So this is flagging what we want to want it to, to flag. Um, now we can just do, now that we have things uh, how we would like, uh, we can say, uh, let's call this like learning lab API secret and save it. Um, so if you want to iterate on uh, writing a rule with a friend or with a colleague, you can basically like save these snippets and send them as links to each other. This is actually how we do it internally, um, where it's like, hey, I want to find this. Like, can you help me like figure out how to do this? And because you can specify like what you intend to find, uh, that's pretty easy. Um, okay, so we wrote a check for this custom secret. We vetted that it worked how we expected it to work by creating this like unit test. Um, we can now say, uh, add this to our scanning policy. So now let's say we had 10, 50, 100 repos. These would all, like every next PR for all those repos would now be scanned for this custom secret that we were not scanning for before, but just with one click, we've rolled it out everywhere. Um, and then let's see. So if we go back, so because the, the checks already ran, uh, without the um, custom API check, we need to like rerun these so that um, SEMGREP will pull in uh, this latest check from the uh, dashboard. Um, and then uh, hopefully we should see uh, a PR comment that said, hey, we flagged this thing uh, that we didn't use to flag. Um, cool. And like, it takes a second because it needs to pull the Docker image uh, and stuff like that. The scan itself is actually quite quick. Um, yeah, any uh, questions about this so far? Nope, I think no questions in the chat. OK, cool. Um, OK, yeah, so this will, this will happen in like a minute or so. Um, Let's see. So next, um, oh yeah, and if you want to go to the slides, um, I'm not going to cover them now, but I just wanted to uh, include them here for your reference. Um, there's a bunch of um, just like a description of like features of SEMGREP and like how to use different operators uh, and things like that. So I wanted to make the slides as sort of like self-contained, useful as possible. So um, feel free to reference these slides um, sort of offline later. Um, but I didn't want to uh, walk through them right now live because I didn't think that that uh, would be that useful. So Clint, um, I got, got a question for you here. So why do you need to specify rule ID in test code while defining the rule? Uh, yeah. Um, so you don't, uh, so I guess, um, so you have to define this because every rule needs a unique identifier. Um, but in terms of this, um, this is just um, like to help you for adding uh, unit tests for your code. Um, but you don't um, have to do that if you don't want to. Um, so I would say like giving a unique identifier to the rule here 
uh, is a requirement um, and adding test cases is, is just nice to have. Okay, does that uh, answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Cool. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, cool, so let's see. I think we should be seeing it. Okay. Um, let's see. Expected to see one more test, but I may be a victim of the demo gods. Um, okay. Well, I will uh, look at this later. Um, yeah, we saw it happen at the beginning, but basically we had a, a custom uh flag uh, of this uh, api token um but perhaps uh let me have uh, foobart something live um but i'll uh look into that and uh, get back to you um okay so um quickly i want to talk about um some new things that have uh just landed uh in SEMGRIP. um so uh we had um in the last hackathon, something that was quickly prototyped that we internally called a uh, dash dash fast mode. Um, so there are some optimizations that if you have the latest version of SimGrip, they're just enabled by default. Um, so there's some pretty cool tricks that happen under the hood where basically um, it looks at um, uh, the source code in the file that's being analyzed and then uh, sort of doesn't do all the uh, time intensive pattern matching if um, uh, it couldn't possibly match. So for example, you're looking for a function named foo, and foo is not in the file. It's just going to preemptively fail out. Um, so there's a bunch of other optimizations that are going to come here. Um, but basically, depending on the repo and the patterns, um, you can actually, um, it's either about as fast or up to like tens or even 30 or I think like 50% in one case uh, faster. So you don't have to do anything. Uh, to get this, uh, just use the latest version of SEMGREP. But um, just wanted to let you know that there's a lot of sort of uh, internal fancy things uh, happening in the engine that are making things uh, ever faster. Um, another thing um, that's been added quite recently is a commutative matching. Um, so basically, in uh, a number of languages like A and B or B and A or like uh, and or and things like that are like um, semantically equivalent. So the engine is now handling a number of those things for you. Um, so for example, if you had a pattern that's like A and B, um, that's actually going to match. Uh, this is obviously the same, but it's also going to match um, in the reverse order. Um, and it's also going to match these two, even though they're sort of um, not quite uh, exactly the same. Um, so feel free to try that out. Uh, and again, the, the goal here is like, we want to make it as simple as possible to write a SEMGRIP rule that uh, matches basically like what you mean. Um, and then here's the biggest change um, that's still very, very early stage, but uh, I'm super excited about. Um, so basically, if you match um, something uh, like a, a meta variable with SEMGRIP, you can actually run uh, arbitrary SEMGREP patterns on what on the code that you just matched with that meta variable. Uh, and this actually works recursively as well. So let's say, so here's your SEMGREP pattern where you're like, OK, find a function definition and then match um, the entire body. So this is another special syntax. So a meta variable, um, just dollar sign body, uh, would match just one thing. But if you want to match like a list of things, um, you can use this dot, dot, dot. Uh, and then like identifier. So here, this is going to match um, all of those. Um, I think actually I created some. Yeah, so this body is going to match all of those. And then if you then create this meta variable pattern clause, you're saying like, okay, for this body, I want to apply this uh, pattern to it. Um, so here we're looking for like the body being uh, foo, 
zero or more statements and then baz. So that's going to match only this and not this because uh, it doesn't call it calls bazes and then and then foo, not the other way around. Um, so basically, like what used to be, um, we have uh, previously like you could run like a regex on something matched with a meta variable or things like that. But now there's sort of like this capability of matching like complex things for any say sequence of arguments or um, uh, statements or, or things like that. Um, let's see. So uh, this is just an example of how you can actually like nest these things if you want to. Um, so you could say, OK, we want to find all calls to foo and grab a reference to the first argument. That first argument should actually be bar and then something else. And then this x should be like two things added together. Um, so this is just an example of like, you can sort of nest this uh, as much as you want. Um, but OK, like why this is maybe intellectually interesting, but like, why do you care? Um, so here, this is an example of finding like an open redirect in Django that used to be, um, you'd have to say like, OK, what are all the different ways that uh, we can get user control data? And then what are all the ways that can, what are all the syncs, like the bad pattern that it could hit? and um, uh, you'd have to do like every source to every sync and sort of like uh, have a bunch of duplicate patterns. But this is how using meta variable pattern we can like uh, deduplicate a lot of that um, redundancy. So here we're saying uh, we're storing some request data into a variable, and then some stuff happens, and then eventually we uh, redirect to to some place. And then we're like, okay, cool. That's the overall structure of the vulnerability we're uh, considering here. And what does request look like? Well, it could be request dot some function dot get, or it could just be directly. So we can enumerate all the ways that user input could come in. Um, and then we're basically saying, oh, whatever this function is, it's not a uh, get full path. Uh, and then for this redirect part, so this thing at the end, this could be the variable we get from user data directly, or maybe it's like string dot format, or maybe um, uh, we use sort of the, the interpolation. So previously, we would have needed to create like different pattern clauses for each of these cases. But now we can like uh, condense all of those down into sort of one concise way. Um, and so this is not uh, quite done yet. But I think it's probably the most exciting application of this is uh, basically scanning polyglot files. So files that have multiple languages inside them. So you can imagine say JavaScript and HTML, or uh, templating files like Jinja, ERB, uh, other things like React, Vue.js, infrastructure as code, Docker files, anything where it's like you have one syntax, but then also like a subset of another language in it. What you're going to be able to do, uh, and this doesn't work yet, but we're currently working on it, is you could say like, OK, you know, run this on some HTML. So we're going to basically slurp up what's ever inside script tags. And then we're going to, uh, oh, this is a typo. This is supposed to be JS. Um, and then interpret whatever you've slurped up as JavaScript, and then run this JavaScript pattern on it. Um, so it, you can imagine in a um, Ansible or other infrastructure as code, uh, you could say like, oh, um, you know, this is the YAML, but then it calls like bash here. And then you could actually extract that bash with a meta variable and then run like a bash semgrep check on it. Um, so this, I think, is pretty cool and very uh, yeah, so intuitive to never, use, like sort of how you would want it to use. But uh, unfortunately, this doesn't work quite yet. Um, but I expect it to uh, hopefully in a few weeks or at most like a month or two. Um, but yeah, so basically, this is, I guess, teasing it. Um, unfortunately, there's not. Um, uh, not quite fully, um, like it can match like small code fragments, but we need to do some work to have it sort of slurp up the entire code you want to match. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's the last thing I wanted to say about that. Any uh, questions? All right, there's a question here. Um, can meta variable pattern refer to other rules? Mm, it's a very good, very good question. Um, currently, not yet. 
but that's definitely something that we uh, have been thinking about for a while and we've been getting a lot of asks for, um, like the ability to compose across patterns. Um, uh, we're definitely going to build that. Um, it's something that we want and we've heard from a number of people. The, the question is more like, how should that look and what is the most intuitive way for that to work? Um, so if you have ideas on how you would love it to work, um, we'd much appreciate hearing from you because um, yeah, that's definitely going to happen, uh, hopefully soonish or like at least by end of year or something. The, the question is more like, how should it work? Um, so currently no, but hopefully in the not too distant future, because I think it'd be very useful. Um, yep. we, want to, we want to make it so like, you know, this pattern can reference this other pattern or you can like override built-in rules. So say we provide a rule that you like, but you want to customize the message or you want to add additional pattern clause or override an existing one. Um, we want to make that easy. Uh, it's not currently that easy, but um, hopefully it will be uh, soon. But yeah, thanks for the question. Um, does that uh, answer it? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think you also had asked uh, I don't know, Gustavo asked this pattern, oh, sorry, where is it, to, to, where other languages, so the pattern matching is available for any supported language? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so, um, let's and see. While you're there, can you also show what languages can use send grep right now? Yeah. Jean-Christophe yeah. asked that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So if you go to uh, the docs and then search for uh, supported languages. Um, so we have a, a couple of different uh, levels of support. So GA means things should work quite solidly. Um, so Go, Java, JavaScript, JSON, Python, Ruby, TypeScript, JSX, TSX. Um, and then Alpha is like, eh, it mostly works uh, on files, but you might want to, um, uh, you might, you're more likely to encounter some bugs. So OCaml, PHP, C, YAML, and some template syntaxes. Um, and then a couple that are like early stage, uh, but are definitely on our radar, uh, Rust, Lua, C Sharp. I think C Sharp we've pushed forward. That might be close to alpha. I need to investigate and then R and a Kotlin. Um, so I would say very good support for these and then um, some support uh, for these. Um, one thing we actually do is, um, so we find a corpus of open source repos for different languages, and then we basically uh, look at how effective we are at parsing them. Um, and so you can see some of those stats here. Um, and along with sort of support expectation, uh, expectations, maturity definitions. Uh, and here's a little bit more uh, sort of in the weeds for like what sort of SimGrep features you can use based on uh, language maturity. Um, but yeah. How do you guys track those? Are they uh, you, you track on GitHub features? You know those those things that mm -hmm. coming next. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, yeah, so if there's a language that you want support for, but you um, uh, it's not where you would like it to be yet. So if you go to SemGrep and then do um, let's say like Scala. Um, Yeah, so there are a couple of tickets tracking support for different languages, like say Swift, Lua, Kotlin, others. Um, I guess there's like a new languages uh, tab, or sorry, tag. Uh, so yeah, if you say care about Lua, um, feel free to like plus one, whatever issue it is for your language. And um, you can see like a discussion about it and you'll get updates for when we're uh, gradually, you know, merging in features that uh, add support for the language. Um, so yeah, I would say if there's not uh, a ticket for the language you want, um, please create it. Uh, we'd love uh, your feedback. Cool, thanks. Uh, wait, any more questions here? Nope. I think that's it from a question point of view. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I have a couple of examples of like iteratively exploring a code base. Um, that I'm happy to do, or if anybody has a uh, some grip, like an example or code snippet they would like us to find, uh, happy happy to do that uh, as well. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll let you think about it, and I'll maybe start. Uh, 
with uh, something else I was going to show, but feel free to um, uh, just sort of stop me. Um, OK, so let's say um, we have a, a new repo that we're auditing. So I uh, forked the Netflix conductor repo, uh, which is open source, and I added in some uh, sort of uh, authorization annotations into the code because I think uh, there's like an interesting demo we can do. Um, but first, um, uh, let's say we uh, want to ensure that our service always communicates over HTTPS and not HTTP. So we want to flag all HTTP URLs uh, in our code base. Um, this is sort of like a common baseline thing that we might care about. Um, so let's say, um, well, first we can see like what's in this repo using the open source tool uh, Toke. Um, so like, OK, cool. We can see like mostly Java. Oh, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. OK, so there's like a couple of different languages. Um, so let's say we wanted to uh, find all uh, like HTTP URL uh, type things. Um, OK, so let's see. It found about 2,300 things. Um, but if we look at this, like these are pretty clearly in comments. Um, and if we uh, go up a bit, like these are in imports. Um, OK, so, so let's say that like if we were wanting to basically ensure all URLs in our application were HTTPS and not HTTP, like grep is like not, not a great way to do it, right? These, it's not aware of comments or like it's matching imports. Like ah, it'd, be, it'd be nice to like have something that's source code aware. So let's um, like quickly prototype how we could do this uh, in SimGrep. And one thing I also like about looking at URLs is that um, it gives you some insight into like what the repo is doing, um, like what's it connecting to and things like that. So let's say, um, let's just write something from scratch here. Um, uh, um, this is like too many things. I do not want all of these. Um, oh yeah, so another thing nice that uh, about some group rules being YAML is that there's like this metadata key where you can put arbitrary things in. So if there's something uh, specific to your company that you would like to embed there, like some sort of um, uh, security check ID or um, you know this team owns this rule, uh, you can easily do that. And that'll be passed through um, in the JSON output. Um, so feel free to sort of add whatever you want there. Um, let's see, actually, let me just wipe this away. Wipe this away. Okay. So um, let's say we want to find all string literals that match, uh, that have HTTP in them. Um, we can use this uh, special syntax. This syntax is like changing soon, uh, to be honest, but um, to make it more yep. intuitive. Um, yeah, question? Oh, no, no, sorry. Oh, no. Um, yeah, so basically um, here, oh, uh, and we can actually also say run this rule on not just Python, but say JavaScript, Ruby, uh, all these other languages. Um, because here we're just looking for like, let's just match um, any uh, string that has HTTP in it. So let's see if this works. Um, cool. So. We're matching all of these. So let's give this uh, a quick name. Oh, yeah. It, uh, 
here we need to make this uh, sometimes the uh, regex syntax uh, breaks the YAML so we need to uh, hand hold it uh, a little bit um, I think actually this Oh no. Sometimes you get in uh, YAML writing uh, frustrations. Sorry, that's why I have a, a backup where the syntax uh, it doesn't switch to um, the simple editor. Uh, OK, so. Sorry, Clint, there's, there's a question here which might be relevant, yes. relevant to this. Says, how to create an exception in the patterns, for example, for commented URLs or the packages. I think didn't you isn't that part of the your, your logic that in, in, in Python, for example, you already knows the difference between the code and and comments? Uh, yes. So um, one design decision is um, so Semgrep uh, generally throws away comments. Um, so uh, it won't match anything in comments. But also, if you want to match things in comments, you would have to use something like pattern regex, not uh, a SEMgrep pattern. Because um, yeah, by default, it uh, uh, doesn't. it's not built for analyzing uh, patterns. But you can match imports and things like that. Um, you would just match them using syntax that would look like imports. Um, yeah, yeah sorry, but, you, but, but, but the Python, the Python parser, for example, understands the difference between code and comments, right? Um, so, yes. so you, you, you won't pick things in comments, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So let's say uh, here. So I copy the exact same line of code, but into a uh, comment. Um, so it will flag this line, but not this line because it's. What about if you actually want to search on the comments? Uh, currently, you would have to use uh, like our regex uh, syntax um, because uh, SimGrep uh, is currently not designed for searching uh, comments. Yeah. So cool. If your goal is like analyzing. Um, like the code itself, we it's just sort of a design decision. There's not like a, a technical reason why we can't analyze comments. We could. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, it's, it's just a, a. Yeah, it makes sense, right? So to, to remove noise, right? Of course. Okay, so another real question: How to detect if a function, let's say SSL set verify, is called with a specific specific argument? Um, so basically, you know, I guess yeah. The the, the question is. How to detect the function does not call the correct expected argument value? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, can you share a, a code snippet with me? I think that we already have. Is, yeah, it's on the chat. If you want to quickly pop to the chat, you can see the yeah. the, the comment there. A specific argument. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Um, Let's see, let me just uh, see how to detect the function such as SSL is called with a specific argument. Um, okay, yeah, so um, let's say, um, yeah, so let's say you had uh, uh, something where you're uh, calling SSL set verify, and you want it to be um, SSL verify peer. Uh, and then, I don't know, let's say other things. And then let's say, uh, I'm just sort of spitballing here. Um, and I don't know, uh, other arguments. Um, so what we could say is, um, so if we wanted to find all calls to um, SSL verify, we could say the ellipsis operator. So we don't care about the arguments. But 
Uh, in this case, we do care about the arguments, right? We care about specifically the value of the second argument. Um, so um, what I would say when you want to find sort of like the inverse of something, you might say something like, OK, well, let's find um, all uh, calls to SSL set verified, but filter out the cases where um, SSL set verify where like uh, again we uh, we don't care about the first argument but if the second argument is uh, the value that you know is safe and you don't care about the rest of the arguments so here we're saying find all calls to SSL set verify filter out the calls where the second argument is a specific thing that we know is safe um, yeah so here we would flag this, but not this, because the second argument is the thing that we care about. Beautiful. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this is great. Uh, thank you for uh, the specific question. That's always more uh, exciting and fun. Uh, yeah, any other questions? I don't think we could. I think this. Yep, you good? Uh, okay, cool. Um, I will um, uh, then maybe skip ahead uh, quickly uh, a little bit just to because I have like two sort of demos that I wanted to uh, quickly show. Um, uh, okay, so let's say basically the process. Uh, I was going to show is like, first, uh, you find <clears throat> that there's, if you just search for HTTP, there's a lot of results, say like 2300. If you search for just um, HTTP in something that's actually a string, uh, that matches uh, even less. Um, and then here, um, let's see, it's at, uh, languages. Um, we can even be um, more precise about it and uh, filter out like calls to localhost or um, 127.0.0.1. Um, so let's see if we uh, copy in that. Basically, the idea is like very quickly we can figure out. Um, uh, why do you do this to me? And um, you can find like just the things that we're looking for. So uh, passing some grep and then pointing it a reference to the rule uh, that we were just writing. Um, <clears throat> we can see uh, in a few seconds, like just the um, potential URLs that are interesting. Um, and uh, we're scanning like a couple hundred thousand lines of code, I believe, um, in uh, about uh, 20 seconds or so. Um, so where previously we were finding a bunch of noise in comments and things like that, here we can see um, these are all in uh, actual source code, like string literals largely. Um, and so we can get sort of like a quick understanding um, of sort of what's going on. Um, OK, so uh, but there were a couple of more things there, but I'm just going to cut to the last example because I think it's uh, potentially um, a bit uh, more interesting um, and sort of builds on things. So let's say we are, uh, again, auditing a repo, and we want to understand what are all the routes that we're exposing because this is an external attack surface. So let's see like how we would go from 0. Uh, to doing that. Um, so here, um, we might start by grepping for things that are like HTTP related. Um, so we might do, say, like get. Um, but like, oh, well, like, I guess in Java, there's a lot of getters and set. Something like a post, maybe. Um, 
So if we start like looking through things, we see a bunch of things that are stubbed out. But um, oh, okay, like this this post looks promising. Um, okay, so this clearly looks like some sort of controller and a router. So we can see uh, there's a queue admin resource with um, some annotations here. We can see a couple of routes. Um, and so this is uh, largely just the existing open source code repo, but I have personally added this uh, secured annotation just for demo purposes. So the rest of the code is the same, but uh, I did add uh, this. Um, OK, so we can see like we've got um, some annotations to say, like, what does this route do? What's like the verb? Uh, what's the path it's at? Does it do auth checking uh, or not? Um, OK, so these are all interesting. Um, let's see. So one thing that we might want to do is like, let's try to find just all the routes that are defined uh, in this application. So, so let's like just copy this existing source code uh, to iterate on. Um, OK, so let's uh, switch to Java because this is Java. Um, we'll just erase our existing work. We'll paste it in here. Um, and OK, so what, what makes this route a route? Like, like as a first pass, we might say something like, well, maybe all the routes have this like API operation annotation. That, that seems like a reasonable assumption. So let's say we want to just uh, copy this in here. And um, let's say, let's just try to break it down to sort of like as simple as possible. Um, so let's try to find any function that uh, has an API operations annotation. Who cares what the value is? Maybe we don't care what the uh, return type is. Uh, the function name, that's going to change. So we probably want to abstract that away. Um, and let's not care what happens inside. So basically what we're doing here is like, let's find any function definition or any method definition that has uh, the API operation annotation. And uh, who cares like basically about anything else about it? Um, let's see. OK, cool. So in about um, you know 30 seconds, we've written a quick pattern that um, is flagging uh, a couple of things. Uh, let's maybe. Uh, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, notice how we aren't matching this one, but why? Because this doesn't take any arguments, and this does. So we actually were a little bit too precise here. So we can take zero or more arguments. So let's try again. Um, so again, notice how like we had an initial idea for what we wanted to find. We tried something. It didn't work. We looked at the test case to see, oh, I, I expected to match this. Like, why didn't I? And then we uh, updated a little bit in like 10 seconds. And now it looks like we're finding more like what we would expect to find. So OK, cool. So let's say, um, let's call this, I don't know, route test maybe. Um, cool. So let's run this on uh, our repo. Um, cool. Yeah. In like a second, we found uh, 67 routes. We can sort of see what they are. Um, OK. Like this, this seems like we're matching what we intended to. So that's pretty cool. Um, OK. So, so one thing that I find, like if I was a security auditor, uh, one thing that I would find pretty interesting um, as I was reviewing the code is this like security annotation, right? So like maybe. Like what? What do we find if we just prep for this? Um, okay, so it's like we see some things have this like secured with admin, some have with user, some with like metadata. Okay, so like we we would need like realistically if we were doing like a source code audit, we would like look more into this to figure out like what exactly is happening here. Um, but at the very least, I think that 
it's probably interesting if we could find any route that doesn't have this annotation on it, right? Because that means like maybe it's intentionally public and doesn't require off, but or maybe someone forgot to add that. So, so how how could we find that um, with SEMgraph? So first we have this base case, which is finding um, all of the routes, and then let's just filter out the cases where they call um, at secured. So we can switch this to and is not. We can change this to uh, at secured. And uh, again, we don't care what the value is. It could be admin, it could be user, it could be whatever. So basically what we're doing here is let's find every route and filter out the routes that uh, have this secured annotation. So let's uh, maybe update this rule. OK, let's try. Oh, cool. So out of the 68 routes we were able to extract, uh, we immediately found three uh, that don't have this uh, annotation. So uh, as an auditor uh, or as an internal security engineer, we might want to do some additional code review to figure out like, oh, why why is this the case? Maybe talk with the development team, say like, hey, is there a reason this is public? Um, but um, yeah, so basically the example I wanted to show here is go from uh, a new repo that you haven't looked at before to figure out how does routing work in this application and like, oh, how do we extract all the routes in just a couple of minutes? And then now uh, after figuring out a little bit about how auth works, we can determine like, oh, what are places that um, uh, auth may not be happening that it should be, right? Because that's potentially suspicious. Um, so if we look at the file names here, like task resource, hmm, like this is a post. So like if it's like updating or creating something, that sounds like something that maybe auth should be happening there. Um, and same for here. And huh, there's like this uh, queue admin resource. So like that sounds pretty dangerous. Um, so if we go here, oh, we're actually already looking at queue admin resource. And we can see most of these routes have this like admin at secured on. So the fact that this one doesn't is probably something that I would look into uh, as an auditor. So again, um, this is sorry. Uh, on, I, on, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on this, is, do you have a way to extract those paths? So if I want to generate a list of every one of those paths, I guess you you're checking if they exist. It's a little bit different, right? The use case, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, so the first part of this is just like discovery, but let's say you want to like automate or extract all of these things. Um, so the nice thing about meta variables is you can like grab reference to things and that's included in the um, uh, the JSON output. Um, so there's a couple of ways we could do this. Um, so one way is uh, we can basically grab a reference to that path here um, and we can, um, just directly like set this say to the to the message uh, if we wanted to. Um, yeah, actually, let me um, let me remove the filter clause so we just find all of them. Um, but yeah, so if you look at here, we are yeah. pulling out all of those. So if we were if we did uh, let's say give this this path. Uh, yeah, so probably, oh, uh, I guess it, this, oh, this should have been removed. Yeah, so basically it's like, there's two ways you can do this. One is like you save the meta variable value to the message and you just sort of like parse those. Mm -hmm. Or um, if you look at the uh, JSON output, um, all the meta variables, let me just, um, Yeah, because it outputs a few things, so it's not. Uh, oh, actually, I need to do this. Um, so there's basically like a metadata dict that. Um, so this is like the JSON output. So if you. 
Yeah, I don't know why it's being annoying with uh, with saving right now. This session got in a weird state. But yeah, basically all of the uh, meta variables. Ah, why do you do this? Um, like all the meta variables you match will then be passed to uh, the JSON output. Um, so then you can sort of like slice and dice them with uh, JQ or just like uh, whatever you want. OK. Uh, um, and demo gods are really biting me today. Um, but so previously, we were matching uh, funk here, which was like the uh, the definition of the uh, route uh, or the, the function. Oh, no, actually, OK. So maybe it was working. Um, and then path here uh, is that. So um, yeah, basically, you could pipe it to JQ and then just extract sort of uh, all of these path uh, abstract contents. Um, or you can make the rule message like JSON itself. I've done that as a hack before. Um, but yeah, basically, any meta variable you match in a pattern um, will then um, be passed through to the output. So you can slice and dice it easily after. Um, so yeah, extracting all these paths uh, would be pretty easy. Um, and I've done this on a bunch of repos. And if you wanted to, you could also grab um, a reference to like the class and uh, the classes path and, and stuff like that. So yeah, basically, um, uh, meta variables you can uh, match one or one thing uh, and pass it through as sort of a capture group to the output. Uh, and the ellipses abstract away zero more things. Um, but yeah, um, any uh, final questions? Well, cool. Um, yeah, I will uh, be around. And uh, thank you all so much for your time and uh, Dinas for having me and uh, for all the great questions. Um, yeah, feel free to uh, check out the slides uh, in the chat and uh, I'll share them uh, later as well. Yeah, no, thanks Thanks for another 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 great session. I think um, there's definitely, you know, like SimGrep is very exciting, so cool. And also uh, thanks for showing us the new, the new things that are just off the press, so that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of them landed like this week and last week. So some of them are uh, uh, just off the press, um, but hopefully hardened out and uh, fleshed out soon. Very cool. All right. Stopping recording. <laughs>